Welcome to the Women at the Top podcast interview series. My name is Regina Barr, and I'm the founder of the Women at the Top Network, and I'll be your host today. Women at the Top, for those of you who don't know us, is a community of like-minded women who share the what vision and mission. And our goal, simply put, is to empower aspiring women to lead. And we do this in a couple of ways, by providing information, training, and connections. Joining me today is Parisa Benya, author of Modern Badass Tales from the Leadership Front. And before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Parisa. Parisa is the founder and CEO of Six Sense Strategy, coaches C-suite and senior leaders who are a high will, high skill, and have a growth mindset. In other words, they're badasses who go 80 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone, but they don't always check to see if their team is strapped in or interested in going for the ride. These leaders are high value to a company, but their edges may start to diminish their value. Parisa has taught entrepreneurship seminars and is a frequent speaker on strategy, leadership, and entrepreneurship. She's a certified professional coach, holds a BA from Northwestern University, and an MBA from NYU's Stern School of Business. She is a badass. So on that note, welcome, Parissa. Regina, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to join you today for this conversation. I'm really excited. I am very excited to have you here, too. And I'll tell you, I love the title of your book. And we're going to start with that because I always like to get the backstory from the author about their book. So tell us what made you write Modern Badass? Oh, well, thank you so much for the question. Uh, this book is written as a love letter to those visionaries, those change agents, those uh, bulls in china shops who uh, break dishes, and sometimes they break too many dishes. And the reason why it's positioned as a love letter, the reason why I wrote it as a love letter is that I am that person. I was that disruptor. I was that change agent. I was that visionary. I was that innovator. What I didn't always do, however, in my corporate life was read the room. And I know how painful it is to be that person. And I also know how difficult it was to lead uh, someone like me. And so what if we were to engage in a conversation lovingly in a spirit of community and and in spirit of being understood as opposed to admonishing someone for being a disruptor or a change agent or an innovator or breaker of china yeah it's interesting um i like that you're posing it as a love letter because like yourself i've worked with all kinds of leaders and i think a good leader is going to find the gifts and help smooth out some of those edges that you've talked about um, or that I mentioned in your introduction. So I, I love that you're recognizing that not only about yourself, but others. And this book is an opportunity for uh, the person themselves or the leader to learn some things and hopefully help folks like yourself be more successful um, and, and not you know, edge themselves out, so to speak. Right. You know, that, and, and it's edged themselves out. So I think about the opportunity cost of us never meeting someone like this. So we know who Steve Jobs is. We know who Serena Williams is. We know who Venus Williams is. We know who Gloria Steinem is. We know who Thomas Edison is. Uh, and I worry about us never meeting people like them because they were sidelined or silenced or they sidelined or silenced themselves like what gifts to society do we not have what innovation do we not benefit from what uh what cultural experiences do we not have because we've not experienced or been in the company of or or heard of these people how do we shine a light to help them not change who they are fundamentally so much as be better understood. I love it. I am originally from New York and I pretty much know how to work with anyone because there are some people in New York that 
some folks might think are a little abrasive. And I just chuckle because that's how I grew up working with a lot of folks like that. So I'm glad, again, that you've written this book. So I want to talk a little bit about you have shared that you feel empathy for these folks, these edgy, sometimes polarizing leaders who, quite frankly, may be rubbing some people the wrong way. So tell us what's your personal connection to them and are they all just toxic and like being difficult just for being difficult sake or do you have another explanation for us? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, the the reason why I have empathy for them is that I, I am that person. Uh, in my corporate life, you know, the definition of insanity, allegedly according to Einstein, is to do the same thing over, over and over again and expect a different result. And um, that's exactly what I did was I was hoping against hope that if I would prove myself right or if I tried to show that I was the smartest person in the room, or that my ideas were the best, that all of a sudden, Eureka, that, you know, the angels will sing and and I would be rewarded for saying to everyone, see, I was right all along. Turns out that that was an unfounded assumption. Uh, and it got me into a lot of trouble. So much so that, uh, and I share this in my book, uh, so much so that a leader of mine said that I was the hardest person ever to manage, which uh, was so heartrending. Uh, it was shocking. It was so hurtful and it was confusing because at, at that point in my career, um, I thought my job was to drive results. I thought my job was to continue to push and push and push. And to hear that it was unwelcome was um, it felt alienating. No matter how much I am aware now of how I contributed to that, it still felt alienating at um, the time. And so the types of leaders I work with, uh, I'm very deliberate. I can tell who is just someone who enjoys being unpleasant versus someone who is a lot like me, not necessarily matchy-matchy, but very similar to me. And the difference between someone who enjoys being a jerk and the types of leaders I love to work with and I think are wonderfully complex is uh, remorse. They don't wake up in the morning with a desire to be hurtful. They don't wake up in the morning to, uh, and desire to upset the apple cart over and over and over again. What they do wake up with in the morning is excitement. What they do wake up with in the morning is a vision of what could be, and they're so engaged and enrolled and, yes, excited in the idea that they just can't help but go. And they don't always have the environmental awareness to check for, hey, does everyone think this is a good idea? Um, do I need to get buy-in? Is there buy-in? They don't, they don't always remember to look for it again because of their excitement and they see in their mind's eye the potential. And that potential is luring them into action because they know of what the upside looks like on the other side of that activity. So the intentions are good. Um, and there is a desire for everyone to win. It's, it's the let's call it the technique of how that gets done, is not always welcoming to the people around them. You know, you talked about environmental awareness, and I think you're bringing some great environmental awareness to other folks, right? Um, to have empathy and compassion for folks that would be different than themselves and to recognize and appreciate what they can bring to the table. Um, it's interesting because... I can be a type A, but I was around someone who was more type A than me and kind of fitting more of that personality. And I'm very direct. So I told that person, I said, you know, I said, gosh, you know, I used to think I was driven, but you really take the cake. And I just had to have a conversation. Sometimes you exhaust me. And it was a gentleman. And he said to me that, um, his wife tells him that all the time. <laughs> so I didn't really feel that badly. And it kind of 
helped bring our relationship to another level because I kind of got permission to say time out, mm. you know, when I had need needed him to take a step back. And he also had permission then to ask me what were my observations or to get feedback from me because he knew he was in a safe space with me, you know, so he could ask me, how did that go in that meeting and things? So I think just you bringing this environmental awareness to other folks is really important too. So I appreciate that you brought that up. Thank you. So now you say that you're on a 25 year mission to be the world renowned advisor and coach of modern badasses. And I love that. And you want to be the advisor and coach of people who lead badasses. So tell us what drives this 25 year commitment. Well, speaking to the opportunity cost, like what if we don't have a Steve Jobs because we have silenced him or her? What if we don't have a Margaret Thatcher if we silenced him or her? Or any person out there who maybe let's say edgy or might have sharp edges, uh, we don't have to like them personally. Uh, Margaret Thatcher's politics and my politics likely don't overlap. And I can recognize her for the powerhouse that she was. And so what is the cost for not having an important voice? What is the cost for not having an innovator? And I am so passionate to have these disparate voices, these diverse voices uh, be available to all of us so that we all benefit from it. And the 25-year mission, along with that 25-year mission, is that I am seeing in my mind's eye that chairwomen or chairmen of corporate boards say, don't waste our time, just call Parisa, because they know that I am all in on the mission, because they know that um, I have a track record of success. So it gets me excited. I mean, it's it's a big it's a big goal. It's a meaty goal. It's even a BHAG uh, to use that acronym. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, it's it's a fun goal. It's it's a calling for me. It feels aligned and it also feels kind of fun. Not kind of, it really is actually a lot of fun. Yeah, I like that you said BHAG. I think it's great that you have this big goal because there is a need and you clearly have a vision for how to meet the need and I'm all about goals. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> Great. So let's talk about your book again. Your book talks about three tips you can share to help modern badasses be better understood. Tell us a little bit about these tips. A wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking. So in that anecdote that you shared a couple of minutes ago about uh, telling the guy that, you know, he was a, a little too much or a little exhausting, uh, what you did in that moment is what's available for all badasses. Uh, you met a badass where they were. You got an, you wanted to develop an understanding of who they are as a person. And so uh, because you felt comfortable sharing that you found him exhausting, uh, he found a way to be able to communicate with you in ways that were effective. So uh, what I suggest to badasses is, is get clear on what your most important values are and what the driver is that makes these values your most important values. So for me specifically, my top values are freedom, truth, justice, creativity, and loyalty. And I know anytime I'm touching something that isn't aligned with at least a couple, if not one of these, that I'm not engaged, um, I'm bored, I might even be a little disruptive or I might have unwelcome contributions. So when I'm clear about that for myself and badasses are clear about that for themselves, when they share that with other people and they're curious about the values driving the person or the people on the other side of the table, then what we have is a shared understanding and a shared language. That it means that I can have a conversation with you using the context of what's important to you so that we're not distracted by language. We are aligned in intention for whatever we are working on together, a goal, a strategy, or what have you. 
So number one, get aligned on your goals, why they're important, and get curious about why uh, why other people's values are important to them. Tip number one. Tip number two is um, admit that you can't do everything yourself. The only time uh, Superman was successful being Superman or Wonder Woman was be successful being Wonder Woman was in the comics and the movies. So embrace being Clark Kent. Embrace being uh, Diana Prince. Ask for help. Nobody believes you when they when you say that you can do it all on your own. Invite people in to share their genius. Invite people in to share their excellent ideas. You you don't have to uh, assume the burden of solving for everything. So that's tip number two. Tip number three is get vulnerable. Admit where you might be scared. Admit where you might be weak. Show everyone where your Achilles heel lives. It, the, and, the, and there's a counterintuitive truth in there. A lot of badasses feel like, well, if someone knows where my Achilles heel is, they will leverage it for whatever reason. But the truth is we all have an Achilles heel. When you share yours, you are uh, naturalizing your human experience and then other people say, oh, okay, you know, this person is sharing a little bit more of themselves with me. I will consequently share a little bit more of myself with them. You know, the fact of the matter is if we pretend like we're invulnerable, it's like an oversized fig leaf. No one believes it. Just, you know, share, share where you're not perfect. Everyone knows you're not perfect. So why, why pretend that you are? So those are my three tips. I think they're great. And I especially like the one about being vulnerable. I think it's hard for women to be vulnerable on a good day, especially in the workplace, but it, I think is especially hard for men. So if you can find a way to help them and allow them uh, to be vulnerable, and if they have the wisdom to allow themselves to be vulnerable, I think that's really important because I think that's sometimes goes a long way uh, in addition to the other things that you mentioned. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, where, where, you know, let's say you and I are working on a project, I bring certain strengths to the table, you're bringing complementary strengths or other strengths that I don't have to the table. The whole does become more than the sum of its parts. And so if we look at sharing vulnerability within the context of the whole being more than the sum of its parts, then everyone, has a vested interest in sharing way, where they may not be as strong so that someone comes in and shows up as uh, as their best self and the third person, a fourth person, a fifth person. So it's it's good for everyone. It's good for our shared success once we are very clear about where we might be most vulnerable. Yeah, I think that's great. So let's shift our focus a little bit to speed and velocity. And you mentioned there's a distinction between the two. So tell us more about why knowing the difference between the two is so important. Absolutely. So if if I were to go all the way back to high school physics, which is, of course, only a few years ago, but if I were to go all the of way course. back to high school physics, <laughs> uh, we learned about speed and velocity. Speed is defined as the rate of travel. Velocity is defined as the rate of travel in a given direction. For our purposes, for leaders in business, velocity is what having a goal looks like. We are, as a team, when we're operating in velocity, we are aligned on what the goal is, we're aligned on what the strategy is, we're all aligned on what our individual contributions are in service of accomplishing the goal. And so we may be disparate people, uh, but it but we are acting in unison and and uh, it's smooth. But if it's just speed, we don't know what the goal is. Everyone's moving at their own rate. Everyone's working on different things. It looks like uh, it it looks disjointed and it looks like we're all 
people who fly off the handle regularly because we're not working in service of something. So being clear on what the goal is and being clear on the path to the goal allows for a badass to be operating at maximum potential and maximum capacity. That's what I want for a badass is to get clear on what velocity looks like and then also be clear on the alignment of their values with velocity. And then once they are, then they knock it out of the park. And then that actually, badass or no, that's true for everyone. Get clear on what velocity is, get clear on how it's aligned with your values and you're always gonna knock it out of the park. I really like that analogy because it, it gives a clear picture. Like <laughs> the picture that I got in my head about speed was just spinning your wheels. You know, you could, it's like having a car on a lift and you're, gunning it and the wheels are just going, but you're not getting anywhere. Or you may be getting places that you don't really want to get to. So I do really appreciate that analogy. Now, Modern Badass talks about negative space and living on the edge as critical talents that badasses possess. So tell us more about the gift of negative space. Oh, I love, love, love negative space. Thank you so much for asking this question. So uh, let's define what negative space is uh, real quick. Uh, negative space is what the FedEx logo is like. So if you look at the FedEx logo, um, somewhat if someone else doesn't point out the arrow for you in the FedEx logo, you don't see that the arrow is there. But once you see the arrow in the FedEx logo, um, that then the logo takes itself up to three, four, 10 X in terms of impact because there's movement, there's velocity. Uh, that arrow is what negative space is. Um, there are other pictures out there where uh, you see, and if you look at it in one way, you see the profile of an older woman. If you look at the same picture another way, you see the profile of a younger woman. Each of those defines the context of of the other. So the reason why I love negative space as much as I do is sometimes negative space is more interesting than positive space. Sometimes paying attention to the fringes gives you an idea of what could come next as opposed to looking only at the subject of a picture. And so by the same token, um, when we want to look at edges or when we want to be on edges, let's imagine a rectangular shaped puzzle. When you want to solve a rectangular shaped puzzle or any puzzle for that matter, you always start with the edges. You don't start with the pieces in the middle because the edges define the opportunity. And so if we were to look at what could be next, what we create next. Let's look at the edges, just like we look at the edge of a puzzle, we define something at the edge of the puzzle, as opposed to only looking at what's exactly in the middle. So that's why I have fun with negative space and, and edges. They, they always tell me what might be available next. I love that uh, a lot of times I tell people especially when I was working with creatives back in the day when I was a marketing executive, that structure can be liberating. You can push the edges once you know where they are. But if you don't have any parameters, it becomes very difficult to know where to play and how to move forward. So I, I love that um, fringe or playing at the edges pieces that you're talking about here. So that's really powerful to me. Speaking of powerful, there's raw power and then there's the strategic deployment of power, which is what you say influences. So how can a modern badass have influence without changing who they are fundamentally, right? Because we want to honor their gifts. So how, how can they have that influence without trying to become someone else who they're not? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question, and this is the crux of the work that I do with all of my badass clients is, um, you know, their their existential fear, as it was, or as it is, is uh, 
I will have to put on a costume to make someone else happy. I have to uh, get a lobotomy to make someone happy. And so the premise of the conversation with them is you don't have to change at all so much as be better understood. So going back to the conversation you and I were having a couple minutes ago about values, how do we become better understood? How do we share who we are or what's important to us such that when we are having difficult conversations, whether it's with a board or the chairman, chairwoman of the board or the president of a company, the strategic deployment of raw power or influence is predicated on that which you know is most important to that person. So asking really good questions to understand what we're dealing with on the surface and then also getting clear on what we're dealing with under the surface so that we can meet people where they are. Everyone has an emotional driver for making a decision, and that's true of a rabbit's foot, a Rolls Royce, B2B, B2C. We all make emotional decisions. And once a badass has a clear understanding of what the concerns might be of the person sitting on the other side of the table or the board, the entire board sitting on the other side of the table, then they deploy their power in ways that will land effectively with those people. Get curious first, ask really good questions, understand what the emotional drivers are, understand what the cost is of the pain that the, that the person or the people may be experiencing. And without changing who you are fundamentally, communicate with them in a way that leverages your talents and lands powerfully with them. And then that way you can speak truth to power with power without it feeling like it was a volcanic outburst, that it lands in a way that someone says, oh my gosh, when can we get started? Or, or, some, or, or other people asking similarly engaged questions of this badass. I loved when you said, especially get curious, because I think when you get curious, it takes you outside of yourself and makes things less about yourself and more about what's going on around, uh, around you. So I would say to folks that are listening or watching today, get curious. So I really love that. And, you know, badasses are naturally curious. I mean, they are the people who love to stand in front of a whiteboard and say, what could we, what would get created if we did X or Y or Z or what's available to all of us or what's the opportunity here? They are wild about open-ended questions, right? They're not wild about closed-ended questions. So, if that's how they show up in life because they are hunting for opportunity, they're create, they're um, curious about opportunity, then by the same token, let's get curious about the people sitting on the other side of the table. What are they worried about? What do they see as opportunity? How do we say yes and to each other so that we up-level each other's ideas? Uh, I think that's wildly exciting when we remember to be curious about each other. Love it. We really love that. So we are actually winding down on time, Parisa, and I know it's mind boggling because the time went so quickly. But before we go today, I'd love for you to offer one piece of advice that would be beneficial to our listeners today as it relates to either being a badass or working with a badass. Oh, well, I'm going being the badass that I am, I'll offer two. <laughs> what is one is uh, reiterating, be curious. Uh, and then the second thing I would offer that my coach often says to me is slow down to speed up. Magical moments can be found when we slow all the way down and we allow ourselves to be more aware and mindful. I love that. I, I have to work on that a little bit myself. So. That'll be my mantra, slow down to speed up. That's, that's awesome. Well, that does conclude our interview with Parisa Bania. Just a reminder, you can learn more about her at www.sixcentstrategy.com. And I'm going to spell that. It's S-I-X 
E-N-S-E strategy.com. And I think it's a little bit of a different word. So I wanted to just spell that for everyone today. So I want to thank you for being here today with us, Parisa. And for those of you who are still here with us, don't forget to visit reginabar.com where you can learn more about upcoming podcasts and other events on our event page. So with that, I want to thank all of you for joining us today and have a great day. 